Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. Before we welcome back an esteemed returning guest, I wanted to give a shout out to our presenting chess education sponsors, Chessable.com. In addition to their many classics, they're introducing new courses all the time, including new classics such as Techniques of Positional Play by friend of the pod, Peter Hein Nielsen, who's done an updated treatment of this classic book. And of course, speaking of friends of the pod, Fiona Steele Anthony has released her first uh, Chessable course starting out in the scotch along collaborating with the IM Alex Astani. So along with all of their many other courses, those are worth checking out, including many that you can download or check out free previews of. As for our guest this week, he was on this podcast way back in episode 64. Uh, funny wow. enough, based on that number. Um, it's a really good interview. I recommend listeners check it out. But obviously, a lot has changed in the intervening years, including even in the intervening last week. But our guest is a renowned Armenian-American trainer and player. He's coached numerous IMs and GMs, including Almira Skripchenko, GM Kate and Trough, and most famously, Grandmaster Levon Aronian, who some of you listeners may have even heard Levon discussing this gentleman in our recent interview. He is a captain and coach, has worked as captain and coach of the U.S. Women's Olympiad team, was the 2023 Chess Educator of the Year. Uh, but unlike many players from his generation, he also remains extremely active as a player. And at the age of 53, he just won his first national championship, winning the U.S. Sen Senior Invitational in convincing fashion, 1.5 points ahead of the field, beating out his fellow American legends like Joel Benjamin, Shabalov, Kaudana, Patrick Wolf, so many others. And I am pleased to welcome back to the program Grandmaster Melek Kachian. Welcome, Melek. Thank you. Thank you very much, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, congratulations. I mean, yeah. I think you have a lot of fans across the the chess landscape, and it was I'm sure it felt good to finally win this title. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's funny. Like I think I said to Yasser, I had never won any single national championship, neither when I was a kid, neither when I was, uh, let's say, young man. So I played the what in Armenia, Azerbaijan, and, uh, uh, and I basically moved to another state in 2001. I came like a short I mean, a few times, but I never actually won it, won it, you know? So <clears throat> this is my first big title. And funny, like I brought most, I mean, a lot of kids to actually win national chat titles, but I never won myself. So this is like a first big one for me, you're right. And I'm, I'm very happy. Yeah, and I have a feeling if you didn't make that known, no one would guess it. People would just assume that you won a title somewhere along the way. You um, know? We all believe in God, right? We all mm -hmm. believe in sort of um, uh, whatever connections. I tell you, it's very funny. Uh, one of my girls, one of my students, Rui Yang Yam, uh, she informed me about like qualifying for your junior back to me. I'm like, okay, I I I, I saved the date and I said, okay, so yeah, sure, I'll be available for helping you to be prepared for the tournament, stuff like that. And then uh, my wife said. So let's go for your birthday. I, uh, my, my birthday is July 6th, Ben. And she said, so let's go to get some vacation. I mean, you've been working so much and uh, the best vacation for you would be best birthday. Let's go to Mexico and let's celebrate, you know? And okay, we took kids and, uh, but I said one thing, you know what? Let's make a smart choice to make a vacation date because I might get an invitation for uh, US senior. I, I Somehow I know my reading is dropped, but somehow I felt I might get a chance. You never know. Right. You know, so Ben, we uh, we booked the plan. I mean, uh, the travel to Mexico, Puerto Vallarta for a vacation. Then I'm going to Vegas uh, in a, in a June to play the National Open. Like you said, I'm trying to be more or less active. Uh, my students playing the tournament. Uh, I am in Vegas uh, with them, with myself. And then one day, like I open my like I re I see my my phone that boom notification from my email box. I'm like, what? What invitation for you as senior? I really thought that like, there's not no chance. But then I thought, oh my gosh. So I got the invitation as a wild card holder. They gave me the wild card. I immediately texted back. I immediately made uh, as much as possible all those, you know, like things like to confirm. I'm sure I'm coming. Guys, I am coming. Don't give away my spot. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was super happy. Um, I confirmed right away. And then, yeah, I mean, then what I had to do, like, um, make some adjustments a week later and yeah, I jumped on my train and then that's it. I mean, we're in St. Louis. 
Yeah, amazing. And I saw your post game interview. I saw a bunch of them, but in one with uh, Grandmaster Kristen Carilla, you mentioned that you had sort of revamped your uh your some of your lifestyle choices and your approach to chess about six months in advance. And you sort of made it sound like you had this tournament in mind, even though you hadn't been invited yet. So I, I'd, I'd like to hear more about that, Malik, like, like the choices you made to try to um, up your game and like how this tournament fit into those choices. Well, Ben, I think for everyone, being on a high stage, it's always like a dream, right? For me, uh, the highest stage, uh, from my perspective, it's US Senior Championship. Because that's the, that's the highest stage for every veteran uh, in chess in the other state to to qualify and to play on. And that's why uh, we know approximately the dates for the tournament. And uh, like you said, yeah, if uh, uh, you needed some time to adjust your body uh, and mind uh, for such tournament. And you're correct. It's not like I made an adjustment like a few days in prior. No, I made an adjustment. Um, I've been working on this like a true... From very much when I decided to go to Texas uh, for Southwest Open, and I already said I need to play some um, uh, some games against the tough opponents, and um, to have, actually start to feel the game, how 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 game goes. Because one thing, whenever you play against like um, let's say 21, 2200 players, it's still obviously there is sort of intensity on it, but it's not as much whenever you play. Let's say 24, 25, 27 other people. You know, this is a different kind of level. So, in order for me to more or less stay in the shape, I had to get back to sort of professional stage and play it against a strong, strong uh, competition. Which my first try was when I played in February, uh, when I was getting that, uh, what you mentioned, like, um, you start the reward, right? Award uh, in Texas. So, I have decided to combine and to play tournament first. And then uh, to get my award. So that's how I combine like uh, playing in Texas and then uh, getting my uh, award. So, yeah. And then afterwards, I tried, I, I tried to play some other tournaments. Uh, I went to the arena tournament. I went this and that. So I was trying to keep keep it, keep it up with my uh, busy training schedule. So it helps me. Uh, in my, I, mean, I lost some rating, but it doesn't really matter. I, I was getting initially, but then I was losing my rating. But it, it's fine. Uh, as long as I was playing the games, I feel some, you know, touches. I, I feel like I can, I can still play this game. It's very important. Another thing is, Ben, it's very helpful. Uh, I start to be working more often with a strong students. That helps me a lot. Because that compared to, let's say, after the pandemic, somehow I lost numbers of my strong students. But now I'm kind of gaining them back. So now uh, some of the you know, top kids uh, in the U.S., they're getting back to me, some I am, some FMs. And working with uh, high-quality students helps you as well. Yeah, that, that all makes sense. Um, so mm-hmm. when you do work with your, your high-level students, are you kind of like walking them through calculation exercises where you're calculating along? Like what is the, or is it more like it helps you keep up with your openings or all of the above? You know what? Uh, this is actually a good question. I, I don't mind to share my thoughts. Uh, maybe it's going to help other other trainers. Mostly, I focusing on openings. You're correct. We work on openings uh, together because I do know other ideas in openings, and uh, I'm sharing my my knowledge. Other thing is, uh, uh, I always I have my own access to the super engines, uh, which is thanks to the company Chessify. We we use a uh, good quality engine analysis, and that also helps my students as well. But mostly, you're correct. Uh, I think um, whenever we talk about like a strong students, um, if I if I have something in mind, some let's say we always follow the trends, right? Let's say uh, new tournaments. I'm sure that some of my kids missing, let's say some of the important games by Magnus or by Fabi by by Nakamura. If I if I believe game has very interesting like a kind of a trend or ideas i have to like share and explain the ideas to everything but mostly yes calculation i'm actually uh, specializing on that i'm actually i love to pre- prepare some uh some tough puzzles some tough calculation i also work uh, a lot on end games uh man because i noticed like um many uh many like uh strong players they kind of uh ignoring work with end games I'm um, not ignoring completely, but sort of uh, not uh, working on them as much as it should be. So 
Yeah, I'm, I'm preparing those kind of examples. Let's say, let's say even like a US a US Indian Championship. I won the game against the uh, uh, against the uh, uh, Doc uh, Root. I mean, he made like a very much like a common mistake in Endgame, which he had he didn't realize that. Okay. Yeah, going to the King and Pawn ending or before? Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Big yeah, big mistake. Yeah, that was instructive. Um, but yeah, the, obviously that worked in your favor. So how does a player of your level, Malik, how do you go about working on endgames? Well, I mean, I've been working on the game since I was a young man. So, right, I studied like uh, uh, many Russian books. I mean, obviously I, I finished the book, let's say, of Dvoretsky, uh, which is enough. But I, more or less, I'm, I'm following some up. Uh, I think for me personally, it was... a. Uh, when I was a kid, I studied the book of uh, old Russian master Lysitsyn. Then uh, I I love the books of like Panchenko. Actually, it, it's been in English as well, I think. And obviously Dvoretsky. But you know what? It's also need to be your own. You kind of need to feel it. So practice. Yes, practice. And, um, you know, for instance, like uh, I tell my students, let's say, uh, certain positions, you can't really, say, study them. You must simply play them. Like practical exercises, and uh, that's how you're also getting better. Let's say I have, let's say, tough positions, for instance. And initially, I'm giving my students, let's say, 10 to 10 minutes to think, and then say it's time for, for us to play. So, whenever you're going to sort of introduce, you have made your mindset. I mean, what's going on? Then let's play, see what's what happened. Can you beat me, or can you find a draw? Can you whatever something like that? You know. So it's it's very important. But working on end games, it's it's important. Because uh, what we do right now, uh, uh, the time control getting shortening, right? And let's say uh, other times you have no time to sit uh, luxury and think about the end game. So what it, which means uh, that important decision must be done over the board. And that's why you have to know a certain type of positions, understand, okay, where to go or where not to go. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, I think these days, obviously still... Uh, if you compare uh, main decision making uh, comes to the middle game, true, but knowing the end game, particularly complex end games, is also very important. Okay, yeah, I mean it sounds like a lot just to uh, <laughs> just to keep up with that, and then of course Process. there's yeah, 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 there's all the other uh, aspects of the game. And that gets to a question from someone you know who you saw in Las Vegas. I know you recently competed there as well. This is from a friend of the friend and supporter of Perpetual Chess, Chris Wayne Scott, who writes in and says, "In Vegas at the National Open, I said to you, I didn't know they let legends play here, and you said you'd only accept the title of a former legend. But now, now that you have this win, are you a regular legend again?" But they, he's just kidding. He says his real question is how you approach playing tournaments, how that approach has changed over the years, how you prepare now versus then, and whether or not you set goals these days. Well, I mean, the major uh, the major difference, what I did these days uh, for about a year, uh, when uh, I started to pay attention to my physicals. Mm -hmm. I, I always taught, uh, not always taught, okay? When I was a kid, I was uh, always uh, well fit, okay? When I was a young man, kid, because I, oh, I've been running, I've been swimming, I've been boxing, I've been doing many things, all right? I've been very physically well fit. Uh, but then, I don't know, life circumstances, lifestyle, this and that, uh, particularly when I moved to another state, particularly when I got cars and yeah. that, I mean, I start to kind of ignore my physicals, start to ignore my physicals. I thought, okay, you know what, uh, I'm, I'm good enough. I have like a sort of, you know, so much strength in my story, so I'll be fine. I'll make it. I'll this and that. And but then at some point, you know, it's a, it's like imagine this: you, uh, you're taking this uh, strength from some sort of, you know, uh, storage, and you're taking it, taking it, taking it, and then at some point there is nothing left in the storage. Right. And that's it. And then you're realizing uh, you're pretty much going down. Like, um, I feel like every time when I play against uh, <clears throat> a decent uh, players, strong players, uh, around like uh, the third, fourth hours, I was collapsing very much, you know. I had, I don't know, either my blood pressure was going up or whatever, but I, I was kind of dealing with like basically being blind, right? So I checked my game uh, when I realized what's my issue. I said, you know what? No, it's time for me to get back to, to my face. Uh, I was like almost 200 pounds and kind of, I'm sorry, fat. 
I kind of. You're allowed to call yourself fat. You just can't go around calling other people. <laughs> no, no, yeah. I mean, I call myself. Even so, right. I never was fat. You know what I'm saying? But I, mean, right. I just, I just thought it's not more. It's not me. Right. So I started working on myself. I dropped some uh, ten pounds initially. Now, I, right now, I'm like a one eighty seven. But my my goal to reach one seventy five. This is my kind of goal. And uh, right now, my body changed a lot. Uh, changed a lot in. For a year, uh, I signed up for, I mean, for closest gym uh, to my home, and I, I hired personal trainer, um, uh, Armina and uh, uh, Armina Kwasnina. So I hired her. Uh, she's she also has some kind of Russian background. She's also very strict to me. That's why I asked her mm-hmm. to be strict to me. Make sure uh, we kind of friends, but I said, you know what, friends, uh, friend friendship is uh, put aside. So I wanted to basically uh, kind of torture me, you know, <laughs> make sure. <laughs> Make sure my body get ready for, for uh, for this level. And I started to get better. I started to feel better, 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 better. Because the industry part, Ben, uh, before pandemic, I was uh, doing other lessons and getting very tired. Then pandemic hit it, right? Uh, uh, it was kind of unknown time, unknown situation. We didn't know what's going on, this and that. But after pandemic, I got very much the same numbers of training lessons a day or even more than it used to be. But I noticed these days, I actually, uh, I'm getting tired much less than before pandemic. Wow. That's great. And, yeah. And what is and the need? Sorry. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, it's okay. Go ahead. Okay. I was just going to ask, what is the nature of the physical training? Like, are you, is it more cardio or weights or what? Well, cardio for sure, uh, mm-hmm. at least once a week. Uh, the way how I do my training, uh, I start doing with, uh, let's say, five, 10 minutes cardio. And then I'm doing like uh, uh, mostly working with my body, I meaning it's like uh, uh, weightlifting and uh, this kind of stuff. And working on my chest, on my uh, legs, everything. You know, it depends, it depends if you have a leg day, you have this day. But cardio goes uh, initially from the beginning as a, like a warm up. And then after the training, uh, if I have a time, and then I have, let's say, uh, I'm trying to like um, have one day where I do more cardio than than other things. Okay, and then I'm trying to always like uh, walk uh, either early morning or late evening after after my lessons or before my lessons. It's also like uh, pretty much cardio for me because I walk like around like uh, forty minutes, uh, forty five minutes with uh, really uh, like uh, intense steps. So uh i'm trying to hit like between like uh uh average like a five uh five thousand i know it's too, too little but still a lot for me like five thousand steps uh, a day sometimes i'm hitting like a seven eight but i mean at least five a day to to keep it up you know okay. it's, it's important yeah and uh but mostly i'll tell you the way how i say it i think uh, cardio is important for your just a uh, heart condition sure but in my opinion Whenever you do uh, with uh, with weight, uh, it's helping you because you kind of uh, whenever, particularly whenever you have let's say uh, three feet thumb exercises, right? And whenever you understand your body is like uh, getting very tired, but you're pushing yourself. You're saying no, this is the goal. You have you gotta do it. You gotta do it. You gotta do it. And every time whenever you're putting some goal and you reaching your goal, it's like you are you are making more belief in yourself. You know, let's say, for instance, man, I played a very tough game against uh, Max Dlugin. It was a very difficult game. And at some point, uh, we both got tired. I, I can feel. I can feel my opponent was very tired. And I knew I'm getting tired as well because, you know what, temporarily, uh, you can feel uh, that it's very, very difficult to control the position. <clears throat> you know, Max Dlugin mentioned something very funny. He said, if we would have a rule about not proposing a draw, Mm-hmm. Most likely, we both we would agree. I mean, agree for draw because it was even position, but very complex, even. And we know at some point we are realized we both don't understand what's going on. It's mm-hmm. tough. It's tough. But then, like I said to myself, no, you can do it. You can do it. And I kind of collect myself, you know. And I, I said to myself, imagine this: this is a lesson, and you must teach your class. Find the best continuation. I just push myself, and I figure out the position. I figured out the position and I knew what to do. While my opponent didn't realize that, so he didn't. He didn't stop. You know, what I'm saying he didn't stop. He didn't like uh, ask these questions. And I feel after one or two moves, when I feel I'm going to my direction, and he's not getting there yet. You know, he did. He didn't realize that. 
So I knew I'm going to win the game. That's huge. So, and can you feel that you have more energy at the board as well? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I feel I had, I mean, uh, I basically was outplaying all my opponents uh, because they all run out of physical strength. Yeah. And on a related note, um, friend of the pod and uh, someone you know well as well, Grandmaster Alex Fishbein, you may have seen this, Malik, but he uh, posted on Facebook. So I want to quote what he wrote because I right. thought it was uh, interesting. He says, first of all, congrats to Malik for his fantastic play and an incredible result of seven out of nine. He was not regarded by most people as a contender for first place, but I noticed that six out of the 10 players are basically inactive. Over the last year, they've played a total of 30 FIDE games, average of five games per player. In the tournament, these six scored a total of minus five. And who played the most over the last year? You guessed it, Melek, with 38 games plus five here. Shabalov was second in activity with 33 games, second place here with plus two. Notice a pattern. So I thought that was a really interesting insight because obviously all you guys are, are legends of American chess. But even at that level, it really, to me, uh, underscored the importance of, of just playing. Listen, Ben, I've been saying that for years. Uh, there's different approaches. But for me, uh, in order for you to be, uh, this is my opinion, right? I mean, I might be wrong, but this is the way how I say it. Uh, if you want to be a coach and if you want to coach strong players, you must be active. No matter how much you're going to stay inactive and uh, keep following the game, keep following the trends, whatever it is, it won't make you sometimes to answer for certain questions for your top students. Simply because you don't feel, you, you don't have a touch. Yeah. So I know I've been damaging my, whatever reputation is, like uh, by dropping my rating. But for me, it was fun to compete against young young kids, young young players, because for me, like it, it's like I mentioned, uh, whenever you're competing against like a 14 years old, 12 years old, 15 years old, it's like a kid to you, right? I mean, yeah. but uh, you still feel the contest. You still feel. And I, yes, I agree with uh, with a Fitch by Post. I saw the post on the, on the Facebook. I think it's very important in my opinion. And particularly when I tell you, I always thought this way. I'm I'm coaching the US women team. I have to be I have to be like a familiar with certain nuances, a certain a certain place, you know. And again, like I said, the one thing whenever you follow chess, which is fine, sure, but another thing is when you actually are still like uh investing your time and play, you know. And I thought this is important. I, I have tried to do as much as possible, even so I'm very busy coaching. Uh I mean, imagine uh, my regular like week hours between like okay, I would say 25, 40 hours a week. I mean, that's a lot of hours to 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 teach kids. I mean, yeah, and I'm still trying to find some time to play some weekend tournament, you know. So I mean, I, I, like like I said, I I thought it's very important. Yeah, and it's a big commitment. I mean, you've got uh, you've got young kids too. Like it's it's not easy. So I, I commend you. But yeah, I mean, and you did you even mentioned this to your credit in our 2018 interview that you felt it was important as a trainer. But to Alex's point, I think it also shows the that it's important as a competitor. Yeah. Um, because uh, all these guys didn't forget how to play chess, but but when when they're not used to navigating the decision making, and you're a little more informed in that regard, I'm sure it helps, and I'm sure you know amateurs like me can can you know extract similar lessons for competing at our levels. No, you're right, you're right, and also I'm also myself. I'm really competitive myself. I'm super competitive. No matter which field you're taking me, uh, uh, if you challenge me, I'm going to make this happen. This is this is what I am. You know, I'm always, and that's why I taught all my kids, all my students, to be competitive, to to believe in themselves, to build the confidence, and to to be strong, mentally yeah. strong. Well, but the competition, the being competitive thing these days, I feel like it can cut both ways because, as you alluded to, you've been losing rating, and I think a lot of players um, from from our generation are losing rating. If you play, it's kind of right. unavoidable. So if you're competitive, like you say, maybe you feel like your stature could be negatively impacted. So it might be that, like, if it weren't for the rating factor, they would play, but but they but it's harder to to do it under those circumstances. Right, I agree. Okay, well, Malik, I want to ask you about openings and your approach to openings next. And I know you mentioned to Christian that your approach to openings has also uh, evolved. And we have another question from a supporter of the podcast um, who asks, sorry, let me just find the right question. This is from Shubham Kumtakar. 
He asks, with the amazing number of tournament games you are playing, plus increasing age, is there a certain way you have designed your opening repertoire or strategized regarding uh, that area of the game? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, well, obviously, I do have my, uh, let's say, <clears throat> established opening repertoire, <clears throat> but it doesn't mean I'm going to be stick with this like uh, for forever, for a long time. Uh, working with different uh, kits, uh, working with different, let's say, situations, different form structure, different openings, helps me as well to handle many different like um, opening structures. So, uh, which kind of gives me like a very much flexibility. Uh, I think in this tournament, I played like every single game, almost I played every single like a different opening. Yeah. I was ready to jump, let's say for even for territory, which let's say officially I haven't played it, you know, uh, over the board. So, yeah, <clears throat> I think uh, uh, one thing to answer to this question, Yes, you must have established opening repertoire with uh, decent opening choices and stick with this for, let's say, regular circumstances. But yes, you got to be also watching and working on some other things um, simply because you never know what's going to happen. I always said this way. This is what I said to my top students. Every nine month, 12 months period, like a baby born, you must add the new opening for, oh, uh, interesting. for yourself. You don't want to play the, I mean, okay, like I said, you're going to keep your openings, like say for the for the all your life, some of the opening lines, which is true, but try to add while you're growing, while you try to get stronger in a chess, try to add after, let's say, one year, calendar year, some people believe nine months, some people believe 12 months, whatever, but after one year of playing certain opening, you add something else. You add something else. You add something else. And that makes you feel, let's say, whenever you become more or less professional. For me, professional, man, whenever you reach, let's say, I would say 2,000, 2,100, more or less, roughly. And imagine this. From that period, if you're going to work, uh, if you have established your opening repertoire, normal, and while you're adding like every, every time one or two opening like a year, right? It makes you be like... Uh, Within next like a uh, eight years period, for instance, makes you be a very strong professional because you'll be like able to play very much everything. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Now, Malik, I know you work with a lot of top young rising amateur players. Uh, do you think that that advice is applicable for adult amateurs as well? It seems like it would be challenging to for. for... I don't think so. No, I mean, we, adults, you have to have to make the adjustments. Yeah. Uh, uh, with adults, uh, I would say you still need to establish like a sort of opening repertoire. Uh, you still need to kind of find uh, your identity, who you are, what type of position you want to play and stick with uh, with it. And um, uh, with adult, I would say, uh, I mean, it depends what's what's the strength of adult, you know what I'm saying? But let's yeah. say you mentioned the amateur. I would say uh, opening knowledge actually need to be shrinked, established, solid but shrinked uh, and the most attention for adults player must be done towards to improving his calculation improving his uh, certain middle game skills and stuff like that because yeah. for adult level uh i don't think so <laughs> i mean opening is going to be matter for him to lose or win the game all right so again uh but make sure don't try to play gambits or blah, 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 or whatever. There's some kind of sneaky opening, some surprising right. openings. No, no, no. Decent, right choices. Okay. And I wanted to ask you, as you mentioned, I, I did check out your games from the tournament. I mean, I was following it as it went along, but then for the interview, I took a look at your game specifically, um, and your openings were quite unpredictable. And I think that can be contrasted with some of your opponents who, as Alex Fishbein mentioned, are, are, aren't as active. So might be a bit more of a stationary target. But I wanted to ask you specifically about the beginning of your game. You mentioned your game against Delugi. So knight f3, c5, and then c3, pawn to c3 on the second move. What was the inspiration for that? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny part, man. <clears throat> uh, while we played against, uh, while we played Delugi, right? Right next to us, um, it was a game played like, uh, I mentioned, but we love to get a bit wrestled and everyone, the Christian. Jason Lane plays against uh, Mishra. And while we make it like a second on third move, they already made 20. 
I mean, I'm like looking for my position. I'm looking for their position. I'm like, wow, that's that's a different, all right? Now, uh, what happened? Um, I prepared. Uh, to be honest, I was I was kind of uh, thinking to play E4, uh, but I think I feel inconvenient. Uh, uh, Max is uh, Max doesn't have, let's say, that much expanded opening choices. He's very much predicted, I would say, but. No matter what he's predicted, he's good at his openings. Uh, another thing is, uh, uh, Max is very well known Blitz player. Super right. Blitz player. Yeah, legend. I mean, I would say legend, like world class legend. You yeah. Know? And um, I mean, we also had some uh, kind of uh, uh, clashes like on on, uh, on chess.com or uh, I think on chess.com mostly, you know. So I I knew I I knew him very well. He knew me very well. I mean, what's my choice? To play E4, jump to his, like, uh, main Sicilian, what he does. I simply did not feel this is the right. If if I will have, let's say, first round, first round, I will jump. You know, the first round makes you be confident. But this is what's different. So you have out of four, then have out of four, mutual respect, white color, tomorrow is the off. So what do I want? I feel I have energy. So what do I want? I want a long game. I want a long game. I knew his skills where he's good at it. And I knew my skills where I feel I'm better than him. Whatever, more or less. I want to have a long game, positional long game. So I rejected to play E4. I played that F3 because uh, initially he played like Retty with D5 and he played Grunfeld. I had some ideas against the Grunfeld. I had some ideas against Retty. When I played that F3, he surprised me. I should be expecting C5 move, but I did not. So when he played C5 move, okay, if I play E5, get back to Sicilian, I just rejected to play Sicilian. Right. If I play C4, it's an English opening. It's not exactly Grunfeld. It's not exactly what I wanted to play. So what do I do? I said, okay, he plays C5. What about if I play C3? And let's say if he plays not F6 or G6, then we're going to get most likely Grunfeld. It's okay. G3 line against Grunfeld, but it's going to be something what I know quite well because I play this many times with both colors and I have many students who plays that actively. And then uh, when I played move C3, I mean, Max played move D5, another unexpected kind of move order for me. I played D4 and the third move completely killed me from preparation. He played E6. <laughs> Max is a very active player. He's supposed to play something like Nazi 6, Bishop F5. And when he played e6, funny, and now if I play bishop f4, logical move, it's going to be what? A London system. The right. system what he plays all, all his, okay, whatever, this day's life, all right? So I said, okay, whatever, let's say play c6, I figure out, let's play e3, let's play like uh, River Slav or Beran, you know, and uh, here you go. We have position very much. Um, uh, not as much popular as it should, I mean, as it is, and uh, but it was a game. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, first three moves took us together, what, half an hour? Uh, like That's so funny. Minutes, something like that. <laughs> right. It's like a poker game, really, in a sense. Yeah, because... it's like a, we, we play like a kind of mind game, you know? Yeah. It's like a, average, like a five minutes per move or something like that, because it's like a, you, you you don't know, like, you're trying to invite him to your territory, he's trying to invite you, I mean, me to, to his territory, so it's kind of mind, mind, mind game. Yeah. Wow. And you described in your interview with Christian, uh, sort of, I don't know if it's similar, but you were torn about what to play against Patrick Wolf as well, you said, right? Yeah. You know what? Uh, I said that. Honestly, it's true. Uh, I, I simply could not, A, I, I didn't have a normal my sleep because I think it's the nerves. I couldn't like, you know, um, it's situations I knew. Uh, Shaba is going to do everything for his game against Dmitry Gurevich because I know Shaba. All right. And um, and this and was this the second to last round or when? Well, I, I, I think uh, going, I still had a two points, uh, two, no, one and a half points, right? Because I drew Kaidanov. Okay. I drew Kaidanov and uh, Shaba beat uh, Benji. Okay. So Shaba beat uh, Benjamin and I drew Kaidanov with black pieces. So it was a one and a half point difference. So if I would, let's say, win Patrick, right, it would be over. Right. But somehow I couldn't control the nerve. And because I know one thing, when I saw, uh, when I prepared against Patrick, I knew I could clearly uh, have a drawn line and uh, go for these positions. 
And I know there is no way I can I can lose with Bishop B5 check against Sicilia, for instance. Uh, but initially, I plan to go with D4, Open Sicilia, and off and fight with Patrick on Open Sicilian battle. Okay. But again, uh, I just feel this is not right because, okay, if I'm going to lose, it's going to be nightmare. You're going for the last round and this like that. So I said this. It's like a Petrosian, my tutor talks to me in my in my mind. I kind of recall what he was telling a story when he was playing Kurosawa in 1962. Seriously. Uh, and I said, okay, in order for Shabbat to overpass me, A, he must beat good age. We black. It's right. not easy task. Right. B, he must beat me. That even, I mean, more difficult task than beating good age. All right, because with Shaba, we always had a crazy game. And I don't think so. And, and I say anyone, Shaba or myself, we dominate. I think, I don't know exactly the score. I think it's roughly even. I know in the tie breaks, uh, I think I beat him uh, in Reno. Uh, we have some rapid chess, something like that. So I knew there is no way he can pass Gurevich, pass me, and pass me on a, on a, uh, on a, on a tie break. It's like a... You must do three things. I mean, yeah. I know it's possible, but it's super unlikely. Super unlikely. You know, and importantly, man, uh, some, I always had this belief. I believe in logic. Logic in everything. And logically, if the whole tournament you play better than your opponent, he can't just suddenly, like, just play like a monster and beat you and beat in on every stage. I can't say, you know what? No way. So when I convinced myself, no way, when I was certain it's no way, again, when I went for the game, I even text my, my friend said, so this is the day. You know, so like a D day. So I actually wanted to go to see what's going on. When I prepared, when I played this position, and when I, fi I finally, uh, when uh, Patrick found this uh, incredible defensive idea, which I kind of missed it initially with Queen C5, Queen C6, uh, and I kind of feel that it's, uh, it's nothing for me to improve. Firstly, Patrick tricked me with a uh, precise move order with Queen B6 versus like against A6. And when Patrick uh, played Queen B6, I realized he actually very much familiar with this position. Somehow I thought he is not familiar as um, as much, you know, because Patrick not being uh, like uh, very much active lately, you know what I'm right. saying? Yeah. But when he figured out this formula, when he figured out this uh, move order, I feel, you know what? He knows this position. He knows the position. So it's difficult to play whenever people, I mean, you can clearly feel your opponent knows this position. You can't take a risk, unnecessary risk. There is no point. Yeah. So I kind of sit down like for 10 minutes. And like I said, and then Pet Petrosia came to my, kind of visited my brain and said, so just take a draw. Nice. Yeah. And for listeners, again, to um, to plug our 2018 interview, Melek told some great stories about studying at a camp where, uh, multiple camps where Petrosian taught for like weeks at a time. Um, yeah. I, I will warn listeners, I was re-listening to that interview, Melek, and we spent about the first 15 minutes talking about the 2018 candidates, which were ongoing. Uh, yeah, talking about yeah, how Lavon yeah. was doing and stuff. So that stuff might not be as interesting for people listening back to. But once we get to the stories, um, it, it's a lot of fun. And and I'd like to get a, a few more stories from you, Malik. And before we get to story time, I wanted to follow up on one other thing Malik was saying, which was your struggles with sleep, particularly as you got closer to uh, having this uh, breakthrough victory national championship so malik i know that i some other many chess players struggle with this because your mind just races during tournaments and i was curious if that's something that you frequently struggle with or was it only because of sort of the magnitude of that particular moment no i mean it's a part of our life uh man i mean uh whenever obviously uh, like you said it's like a, you know it's like a, a water boiling you know it's at some point your brain reaching certain level which basically couldn't couldn't stop, couldn't resist. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we always, uh, whenever finally, like whenever I watched the first time movie Queen's Gambit, right? Uh, with uh, whenever she was kind of uh, seeing all those pictures in mind, like all those pieces. It's actually true. Uh, it's a I, I I won't call it nightmare. It's just uh, your brain doesn't doesn't stop, uh, doesn't get any rest. Yeah, you keep thinking, you keep thinking. It's like um. 
you know, it's like a loop, you know, like it's keep coming to the same place and the same place. It's difficult. Yeah, it's difficult. I, I remember that night I, I tried to watch the movie. <laughs> Neither work out. I tried to lay down. Neither work out. I tried to close all uh, curtains. I mean, it's kind of a situation when you simply like, uh, but within our day, I just uh, uh, took a cold shower. I just took a cold shower as kind of stand like that. And then, you know what? I, I forced myself to stay like under cold water, like for a minute or two. It kind of uh, cooled myself down. And then finally, I went for the bed and then I kind of slept. It's okay. But it, it happens. Unfortunately, this is part of our life. Um, that's what we do because uh, we are working with our brain and uh, uh, we need to somehow find find a way to cool yourself down. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll try that next time. Yeah, because I struggle with it too sometimes during tournaments and I'm not someone that generally has trouble sleeping. It's like, only yeah. chess tournaments. Uh, right, 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 right. To do that to me. Um, now, on a different topic, Malik, again, you discussed your relationship with Levon some um, in, in our prior interview, and I'm sure you have in many other interviews as well. I was reviewing your history, and obviously you have a rich history at the Olympiad, particularly as a coach and a trainer, but I saw that you played in in uh, in Armenia in 1996. Um, yeah with an FM Levon Aronian as a yeah. reserve board. Yeah. So yeah. what are your memories of uh, competing in, in that Olympiad? Well, I mean, uh, Levon was definitely, obviously, since I saw he was super talented uh, when I saw him first time. And at Olympiad 1996, I think I almost qualified for the first team, but I didn't make it maybe like because, I think I didn't make it because uh, uh, we had a newcomer, uh, Sergei Mopsisian, who, who just uh, came for uh, that year, uh, Armenian Championship, uh, he was switching federation from, I think, from Czechia uh, to Armenia. And he was also a FIDE master, but he was already like a 2600 like a FIDE. So even so, uh, I think myself and uh, uh, Mirumia, we passed him, but somehow we didn't have those uh, strong credentials, like a FIDE rating as strong as he. So team had decided to take him uh, as a reserve, and somehow me and the uh, again, we moved to the uh, second team. And Levon was also part of part of it, definitely, because he was already like a 2350, 2400, right? Fide, don't mistake, something like that. And playing with him, uh, with the same team, it was fun, yeah. But I mean, we already before that, uh, Ben, we already, we, we already played uh, some tournaments, we traveled to Czechia. I think we played Pardubica, we played some tournaments. So we, we actually compete in some tournaments already, like on the same level. So we either had some kind of history. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I told you I was going to ask you about this. Uh, listeners, this hasn't come out yet as we record this here on July 27th, but listeners may have heard I asked Levon about traveling in the cargo department of a plane, something that was reported in The New Yorker. And he mentioned that his mom sometimes had to travel with him but he also mentioned you. So I wanted to get your perspective on uh, those those humble beginnings. Oh, yeah. I mean, OK, uh, it's true, by the way. We did, we did travel a few times. I don't remember exactly how many times, one or two. Uh, <clears throat> but it was uh, because as, uh, back then, uh, Armenia was kind of, uh, you know, uh, having many, many issues. And one of the issues in uh, it's a crisis um, and it's a crisis because I think we have a crisis with, uh, with oils and everything. And it simply, it was no uh, no flights, I would say, you know, no regular flights. And uh, what happened, um, I got an uh, invitation to uh, to work uh, in Moldova uh, because I had a student there, uh, Amira Skripchenko. And uh, I had an invitation to uh, travel. And, uh, but basically, the only thing is what to do to reach there. But we never had um, uh, like a flight. So... And then uh, uh, Leon's mom uh, said, "I don't know she found uh, she found some kind of connection. She we through our sponsors, uh, this the, these people somehow we found we found a way to travel through cargo. And Ben, I'll tell you, this is incredible. I mean, at some point we thought this this plane is going to go down. <laughs> it was too old. <laughs> and, yeah, it was." We didn't know what to do, like a scream or laugh, you know, it's like a oh, this like, situation like this. <laughs> but it was fun. Yeah, finally we made it. <clears throat> finally we made it. I'm like, oh my gosh, no, no, no more, no more of those planes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and Levon was very little. Uh, I think Levon was uh, 
How old you are? I mean, I don't recall. I think he was like maybe 10 or 11. Okay. Because he, yeah, he wasn't, it didn't sound in his telling of the story, he didn't sound as terrified. So maybe it is because he was younger. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, he was, I think he was laughing actually. He was, he, yeah. he was a kid, you know? He was right. a kid. Uh, I'm trying to recall what year was that, Ben? This is actually an excellent question. Maybe it was 1993, uh, but I'm not sure exactly. I, I had to like a kind of, you know, check my memory. I think it was 1993, and 1990, maybe 1994 even, because. I think we were prepared. we were working in Moldova I, and we were staying there. I remember we, we went there like a, I think it was right before the second, 1994. Yeah, I think so. Okay. And yeah. I and I asked Levon, of course, it's also kind of the stuff of legend. Um you you live with his family for a while. Um, you guys like his family and you did not have a lot of money. As you mentioned, it was a tough time in Armenia. And Levon often had to play play chess games for money to help support his family from from a very young age. So I was curious, how often were you sort of ringside for those those chess matches that were arranged? I don't remember exactly, but yeah, we, we had a tough time. I mean, OK, I was basically like officially a refugee uh, from uh, Baku. And uh, when I moved to Armenia, I graduated my uh, university and then I simply had no place to stay. I probably will leave Armenia, I would go to, I don't know, back then, Moscow or somewhere. But then um, I found, uh, um, I mean, I, I, be, I mean, I found a kid. I found, the, actually, I've been introduced to the Levon. <laughs> uh, and then, um, yeah, Levon's mom uh, suggested and faxed to her. She offered me to a uh, place to stay. And uh, we become a family. And... Uh, yeah, it was a struggle for, for, for me, for them together. But somehow uh we tried to play tournaments and basically whatever it was earned, we tried to like uh, put on the table, you know? Yeah. I mean uh, I was doing some maybe extra lessons like to earn something or some tournaments. But I'll tell you what, Beth, it makes us it makes him to be tougher. Yeah. So Levon. Even being really super kind, super intelligent, super always like laughing, and he still kept his smile, uh, and he kept his still uh, like um, kindness, I would say. Uh, but Levon grew up in very tough conditions, and he he became very mature at very early early age. You know, so I think, uh, I mean. What we deal with, uh, what we deal back then uh, with out of life uh, situations um, made him to be uh, kind of tougher. And uh, I hope it helps him to be a man, you know, like in a, in a, st- a strong personality. Yeah. Well, I mean, he comes across as an exemplary personality. So, um, right, right, yeah. right. And he proved it. He, he proved it in many, like, uh, in many. Uh, difficult situations on his life, uh, on his tournament situations, he actually proved to, to move on and, you know, and uh, still like to play strong. I mean, that's why he still remained uh, for many years. I mean, how long Levon remains as a top player? Since uh, roughly like from 2005, I think, 2005, 2004. So almost 20 years, he stayed on the top. Yeah. It's not easy. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, well, Malik, it's been great to catch up. Uh, I just wanted to see if you have any other stories that I can um, get out of you before we say goodbye. So I was checking out your chess base. I saw that you played Hikaru, I believe, twice over the board, Kamsky, um, Mickey Adams. You already told your Spassky story, <laughs> your your legendary <laughs> drinking with Spassky story. But I wanted to see if uh, if if saying those names uh, jogs any other memories that you might want to share. I mean, uh, I think Spassky's story is hilarious. It's like a it's the most amazing story in my life. Um, I don't know. I didn't kind of prepare to be honest, Ben. Uh, I had many, many stories. Uh, uh, I don't know. I need if to, like, you can't think of any on the spot, we can save it for next time. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, let's do that. I, I, I don't want to like spoil, you know. I mean, I have many good stories. I can always tell about uh, how I was a kid. I, let's say I played tennis against Tera Petrosian and he beat us. Oh, wow. How was this game? <laughs> well, he was amazing in, in the table tennis. 
Oh, okay. Table tennis. Okay. Yeah, table tennis. He was incredible. He was yeah. uh, so quick, uh, surprisingly, and he was beating uh, all the, all our youngsters, you know. And then he was beating us in the blitz games all the time. And how old was he at the time? 1982. So like 53, 52, 53. Okay. And yeah. was, so it comes up a lot. I mean, I, I feel like it's changed over time. Everyone now sort of concedes that Blitz can be good for your game. But was he like a, a Blitz uh, enthusiast? World champion cannot be what enthusiast. No, he's professional. Okay. I, yeah. Well, you these know, days, a world I, champion can. Or, <laughs> um, But yeah, back you know, then. I, I, I forgot who said that. I think it was him, by the way. Uh, one thing, whenever you are grandmaster... You can reach that. Another thing is when you have a uh, when you world champion, it's a different kind of uh, personality, you know. And uh, I think, honestly, I'll tell you something, Ben. Uh, I'm grandmaster, but sometimes uh, you feel like uh, ashamed of holding this title because you can understand people like, uh, let's say, uh, my struggle grandmaster. They play different chess, mm -hmm. and the funniest part, let's say, that's what I told, like uh, even to like uh, some top kids uh, in the United States. I said, one thing when you are like, say, bouncing between 25, 2600, you can still, you can talk about yourself, how great you are, how good you are, you know, whatever you, you whatever you want to say. But whenever you constantly facing people 26, 2700, or even I would say 26, 26, 1500, like 50 points, really, you can say, oh my gosh, this is a different world. Different yeah. world. And when you face 2650, 2700, that's another world. That's another level of chess player. You know, it's like, a, you know, those people are more professional by any means. They do the same thing as you do, but they do it better. Right. They do it better. They do it more precisely. And imagine if you do talk about 2700. That's why for me, when I see chess of, let's say, Fabiano or Dakamura or, or those or the top monsters. I sometimes see the way what they do, the way what they play. I'm like, what the heck is going on? I have no idea. Right. Yeah. I mean, what is this? You know, that's why for me, uh, even if you say Petrosian wasn't really like a true blitz player or something, but no, I think all of them, they're great. Yeah. All of them. And I, I tell you what, this is my vision, my opinion, my secret. The strength of those old people, old school, comes with the bleeds because that's where you understand the strength of those people. Because where are we going to go there, man? It's it's difficult for us to have a stamina to play a long game. But to kick butt of some youngsters in the bleeds game, we can still do that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right. Well, Malik, congratulations again. So happy for you, as are so many others. Um, and yeah, it was great to catch up. Thank you, sir. Thank you, man.